everyone. Welcome to The Chronicle Live, our virtual wine and cheese picnic with Esther Mobley today. My name is Serena Dye. I am the senior editor of Food and Wine here at the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, our aim at The Chronicle is to produce live stream events that provide our readers another platform to connect with the many talented voices you read every day at EstherChronicle.com, including Esther. Uh, you can always find these events and subscriber exclusive perks on sfchronicle.com slash membership. So tonight we have our esteemed, wonderful wine critic, Esther Mobley. She's gonna be tasting a variety of wines and cheeses from around the Bay Area, um, including ones that are featured on her top wineries list that is uh, um, online. And you are encouraged to follow along, but like any good picnic, feel free to pick and choose which wines or cheeses you wanna try. Um, and I am super excited. So without further ado, welcome Esther. Thank you, Serena. And Serena's my esteemed editor. She she makes all of my work better, and it's been a joy working with her the last year. Hi, everyone. I, I can't see you this time. The the past um, things we've done over Zoom, but um, I hope you'll comment and let me know that you're here and say hello. Hi. <laughs> Um, so we're here tonight to taste two things that uh, were really made for each other, uh, wine and cheese. So um, we've done a number of these, these virtual wine events since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, a few of them we've done sa some uh, really funny, uh, weird, zany food pairings we've paired with Ritz crackers and beef jerky and hummus. Um, We've tasted wines that uh, were, were standouts at the San Francisco Chronicle Wine Competition. We've made cocktails together. Um, but this time I figured we would just try to keep it simple and uh, pair wine with cheese. It's a classic pairing. Um, so I don't know who we've got here tonight joining us, but uh, before we dive in, I thought we'd just um, start by uh, talking about some of the kind of basic wine and food pairing tenets that I think are helpful to keep in mind as you're doing this. When you're eating dinner and drinking, you do not need to do this, but um, when you're trying to be thoughtful about it, I think it's kind of fun to, to try to keep in mind what we're doing. So, so there's kind of two main ways of thinking about wine and food pairing. We think about having contrasting pairings, so um, opposites where the wine and the food pull you kind of in opposite directions and you get a balanced pairing that way. So, um, you know, you think about a kind of super refreshing sparkling wine with greasy fried chicken, that's a great pairing. Um, or you think about spicy food that sets your mouth on fire with a sweeter wine that, that kind of tames the spice a little bit so that's one, one kind of school of thought, the contrasting wine pairings. Um, and then on the other hand, we think about doing complementary wine pairings. So uh, instances where the wine and the food actually kind of amplify certain flavors, echo each other and meet somewhere in the middle. So um, you think about a, a cold, briny, salty oyster with a glass of briny, salty, cold Muscadet wine from France, or um, gamey lamb with a, a kind of meaty, gamey Syrah. Um, so those are, you know, you can kind of go in either of those directions. And of course, you can imagine instances where both of those wouldn't work. So if you drink a super buttery Chardonnay with a piece of lobster that's just like drenched in butter. To me, that's probably too much butter. Um, but, uh, but you know, for the most part, you can kind of think about it in those terms. Um, but, but flavor isn't the only component of wine or food. There's also texture is another very important part. So um, what, I, what I think we're gonna be doing a lot of tonight is um, thinking about pairing the kind of intensity to intensity. So a delicate wine with a delicate cheese, an intense wine with an intense cheese. Um, this tends to be a, a pretty good way of thinking about things. Um, you know, it's kind of the same reason you wouldn't have a huge red wine with a like delicate piece of fish. 
It's just that they're kind of on different decibel levels, right? Um, so I think if you kind of think about it in that way, you can't go wrong. And um, one thing I really want us to think about is, is breaking free of the idea of certain things only go with red wines, certain things only go with white wines. I actually think if you think about the intensity question, um, you you might be surprised where red and white wines fit into the equation. Um, so that's that's kind of how I've been thinking about it. Um, so, okay, let's see. I, I wanna hear from you guys before we dive in. Um, who got the wines? Who 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 has some wines in hand? And if you do, um, if you if you got different wines from what I have, let me know. Post in the comments. So, um, just to review what we're going to be tasting tonight, I'm tasting um, the Bedrock. You can see the label is very wet because it's been in my fridge. Um, I'm tasting the Bedrock Riesling from Wurz Vineyard, which is in Hollister. We're going to hear a little bit more about that but I encouraged all of you to get another dry Riesling. Could be any dry Riesling. Um, I'm gonna be tasting the Hansel Sabella Chardonnay. So uh, this is from Sonoma. And uh, it's one of my favorite Chardonnay producers in California. Um, but I, I encourage you to get any, any Chardonnay that was kind of on the leaner side, more mineral, less creamy. And then finally, I'm going to be tasting um, the HRW Zinfandel from Hendry Ranch, which is in Napa Valley, at the kind of southern end of Napa Valley. Um, but I, I said, just get a Zin. So um, I'm sure many of you got other versions of those wines or only some of them. It, it all doesn't matter. Um, and then I have good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Martinelli Chardonnay, Riesling. Oh, cool, cool. Um, good. Yeah. The, the possibilities are endless and some of you may even end up with better pairings than what I have. Oh, someone's Megan's got the Coravin. Okay. Those are all great wines. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. Scribe Riesling, Heights Chardonnay and uh, Dash Zen. I love all those, all three and, uh, all Bay area producers. So that's cool. Um, okay. And by the way, guys, the other thing I always try to remember to tell everyone is uh, we, we're kind of making a big deal about wine and food pairing here just because it's fun and what else is there to do over Zoom or Steamyard in this case on a Tuesday afternoon. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. And you can drink whatever you want with whatever you want to eat. And uh, I do it all the time. If I want to open a bottle, but I'm having something for dinner, just do it. That's that's the end of the day. Oh yeah, we've got trifathin Riesling. I love, love that. Oh, and um, oh, you're opening a, uh, a 2005 Rosenblumzen from Hendry. That's really cool. Yeah, so, so same vineyard, but different producer. Love that. Okay. Um, Walter Scott Chardonnay from Oregon. That's one of my favorites. That was one of my uh, first wine of the weeks when we launched that series back in... Uh, Back in the fall, that's a really, really, really good wine. Anyone else should seek out those wines. Um, okay, so so why do wine and cheese go together? There's a few reasons that come to mind. Um, so cheese is is like wine, very complex. Uh, it's kind of capable of of intense flavors, nuanced flavors, deep layered flavors. Not every type of food is cheese is wine is. So I think that's one reason we think of them in the same breath often. They're both fermented, uh, which has a lot to do with the reasons they're complex. Um, but really, I think what makes wine and cheese such great partners is they're both things that are capable of expressing a sense of place. So we know that wine can, uh, can kind of have a distinctive characteristic based on the place it was grown. This is a concept we often refer to as terroir, and cheese really can too. Um, and if you're familiar with uh, the appellation system that governs wine and vineyards and uh, these kind of geographically uh, government designated uh, regions for wine growing, cheese has them too. Um, in Europe, in France, they take it just as seriously as they do for wine. So 
for instance, if you've ever had a comte cheese, one of my favorites, um, that's a that's a cheese that has an appellation just like wine does. Just you know, you can't call it comte unless it's from comte, just like you can't call it champagne unless it's from champagne. So, um, cheese can be really serious. I'm sure all of you know that. Um, one of my goals for tonight is to uh, break through the the instinctive reach for red wine when it comes to cheese. Um, obviously, there are many instances where uh, red wine goes beautifully with cheese. I think we're going to experience at least one of those tonight. But um, I actually think across the board, white wine tends to be a much more versatile pairing with cheese. Um, it, it has to do with that intensity thing. So I think there's a lot of really mild, delicate cheeses that can easily get overpowered by red wines. And um, I'm often reaching for white wines when uh, I'm eating a cheese plate, especially right before dinner. Um, and I've kind of arranged this so we have like one wine with one cheese, one wine with one cheese, one wine with one cheese. But the idea is going to be that we kind of taste everything, you taste whatever you have, and um, be bold. Tell me what you're thinking as you're tasting them. Um, okay, so let's start with the first one. This is, uh, I'm going to pour myself some Riesling, and I encourage you all to do the same. So Riesling, who likes Riesling? Does anyone dislike Riesling? <laughs> um Riesling is a, a tragically misunderstood grape variety. It sounds like a lot of a lot of you guys sought out really good Riesling, so I uh, I I'm probably preaching to the choir here. A lot of people think Riesling is always sweet. Of course, it's not always sweet, and even when it is a little bit sweet, um, sometimes that's really good. Sometimes the the Riesling is a, a naturally very very high acid grape, so. Um, Often you need a little bit of sweetness to counter out that like extreme tartness. Um, but I've chosen a dry Riesling here. And um, I don't know if anyone has this wine with, someone went to Alsace just for Riesling. That's a very, very good place for it. Um, so uh, this wine that I have here is a, is, a, is a pretty interesting and unusual wine. I can't figure out which way my camera's going. This is a, uh, the Bedrock Riesling from the Wurz Vineyard. So, if anyone has a, uh, if anyone has has heard of Bedrock, it's probably for Zinfandel. They're they're uh, it's a winery in Sonoma. They're famous for their focus on Zinfandel, and they have uh, a lot of uh, they have a big focus on um, historic vineyards, old vineyards that that you know, speak to California's past. And this is actually an old Riesling vineyard, which you don't see very many of in California. So um, this vineyard is in Hollister. If anyone knows where that is, it's actually um, the, the San Andreas fault goes through the vineyard. So um, that makes it pretty interesting. You have different soils on either side of the fault line. Um, it was planted in the 60s. Uh, we really don't have very many Riesling vineyards in California that date back to that era. And if you've ever seen an old Zinfandel vineyard that have these kind of bush looking vines that are not on a trellis all connected, these actually look like that. So it's pretty unusual to find Riesling like that. Um, it's also a really interesting vineyard because the soils are granite and limestone, which again, you don't just see everywhere. Those are pretty coveted soils for wine. And um, so it produces some really cool uh, Riesling. Um, so does anyone have a very petrol forward Riesling, a kind of kerosene uh, aroma Riesling? Mine is, um, if some of you have Rieslings from uh, Germany or Austria or Alsace, you may be experiencing some of that too. So um, that this kind of petrol note, I mean, that's a fancy way of saying it smells like gasoline, um, is, a, is, a, is kind of one of Riesling's characteristic uh, notes. And um, some people love it, some people hate it. I absolutely love it. I just think it I don't know if I've developed an acquired taste for it or what, but I think it's it's really super, just like super enchanting. I I don't know. Maybe some people like the smell of gasoline too. <laughs> um, yeah, I to me this this wine is like lime and mint. 
very fresh and um, yeah, okay, cool. We've got some German Rieslings in there. Riesling is great with Thai food. I mean, it's funny, the lime and the mint things I'm getting here, um, I think those are flavors that would go very well with Thai food. And then of course, if you do have a little bit of sweetness in a Riesling, that can be really good with like heat spice. The Handley, yeah, Handley, that's a good producer from Anderson Valley. So um, the cheese I'm gonna be tasting with this is, um, the, the cheese is called Acapella and it's from Andante Dairy. It's in Petaluma. Um, it's a, does anyone know, tastes better than it smells. <laughs> um, does anyone know of the Andante dairy cheeses? They're really, really good. They're all named for music. Um, the owner is uh, from South Korea and she's uh, been exporting a lot of her cheese into South Korea. Um, and so, so a, a cheese that, so this is a soft ripened goat cheese. I don't know who, what you all got, it's not like a, um, here, I'll show you. It's not like uh, the Laura Chanel. Um, so you can see it's coated in uh, vegetable ash, but the interior is creamy and white. Yeah. So um, if anyone's familiar with Humboldt Fog, the cheese from Cypress Grove up in um, Northern California in Humboldt County, it's kind of a similar idea. Um, it's actually, so it's, this is not a fresh chev. This is a, 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 a slightly aged goat cheese that has developed a rind. The vegetable ash gives it this really, to me, interesting mineral character. And um, I think I love this type of a cheese, but regular goat cheese will also, will also do. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a soft ripened Laura Chanel. Um, so give the cheese a taste on its own first. I mean, you guys may just be already mid meal with your wine and your cheese, but I'm, I'm just going to taste the cheese on its own for a moment. It smells, I'm smelling it just from here. Mm. I love that. I mean, there's like a slight textural contrast between the rind, which is very soft in this case, and then just the kind of pasty, creamy, delicious. So a few things, goat cheese is a high acid cheese. Riesling is a very high acid wine, one of the kind of highest acid wines. So um, I wanted to taste the two together for that reason. Just get that kind of acidity on acidity, bright on bright uh, goat cheese. Yeah. Oh, drunken goat cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good cheese. Um, wow. But I also thought that the the petroly note in the Riesling might be a good match for the kind of slight funkiness of this type of a soft ripened goat cheese. Is anyone finding that? Or what do you think? So I like to kind of like go back and forth when I'm trying to taste thoughtfully, taste the wine on its own, taste the food on its own. And then you cut, I, I kind of like to get like, here, I'm gonna do it now. A swig of wine, taste the food, and then another swig of wine. You guys got some good cheeses. Yeah, so I kind of think like delicate cheese, delicate wine overall, but you've got the acidity matching. And then you've got just these kind of slight notes of interest. Like this isn't just a straightforward light bodied white wine, like um, kind of clean Sauvignon Blanc. To me, the Petrali note gives it like that little kind of savory, funky edge. Similarly, this isn't just like a totally creamy, light, you know, cheese like it's it's giving you something back both of them are i think what did anyone else think are these uh, is this a good pairing do you have a different wine you would drink with this cheese or um, a different cheese you would eat with this wine and yes we there there will be a, a recording of this later rupee 
The Vermont cream. Oh, I love Vermont cream and cheeses. It overpowers the wine. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I it, depending on um, on the wine and the cheese. I think it could. I mean, this is this is a powerful cheese that I'm I'm eating. Mm. Dr. Frank, Dr. Constantine Frank. That's a great, great producer from upstate New York. Yeah. Yeah. To me, the petrol notes are just um, in, intoxicating, I guess, in more ways than one. Um, any other comments about this? I think this tastes good together. I mean, um, or at least my two, my two prototypes do. Yeah, the drunken goat could go with reds as well. Well, that's that's um, the drunken goat is uh, is soaked in red wine, isn't it? Yeah, little giant gloomy rind or bloomy rind. I don't know. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. Well, I'm going. I'm gonna polish off this riesling and move on to chardonnay. Okay, chardonnay. Who has Chardonnay? I hope you all have some Chardonnay. I can't remember all the wines we've tasted in these Zoom Zoom classes, and I don't know how many of you guys are repeat customers here, but um, I love Chardonnay. I would drink Chardonnay all the time. And um, uh, Hansel is, is, to me, hands down, one of the great Chardonnay producers in California. So um, does anyone know of Hansel? Has anyone heard of it? It's uh, it's it's kind of a pioneering um, producer, Chardonnay producer, really for all of California. They were among the first, excuse me, to introduce temperature control for their uh, for their Chardonnays, which which made a big difference in terms of keeping a kind of clean, lean profile. Um, and they're also famous for doing a lot of their Chardonnay in this more um, what, what people like to refer to as a Chablis kind of style um, on the more minerally taut, uh, quiet, delicate side of the spectrum, as opposed to the kind of blousey, big, uh, you know, butterscotchy uh, side that Chardonnay can also do. And I, I love Chardonnays in that style also. Um, but this to me is just one of the great examples of it in that other. Um, so, Sabella, so this is this is this is Hensel's Sabella Chardonnay. It's I can't figure out my camera. <laughs> um, Sabella is it's it's kind of their uh, entry level Chardonnay, their um, lower lower end Chardonnay. It's not their kind of the flagship Chardonnay, um, and uh, it's made from the younger vines on their property. So if you've ever been to Sonoma, if you know. Um, there's an appellation that now they call Moon Mountain, but um, it's essentially the, if you if you know where Mount Veter is in Napa, it's kind of just on the Sonoma side of it. Go So, you know, facing west. Um, this is kind of a, toward the bottom of that in Sonoma. And um, it, uh, so, so the Sabella bottling is their younger vines. I think they may actually um, source some, uh, some grapes from other vineyards too. Um, but so to me, yeah, this is just a great, delicious Chardonnay nose. There's there's some creaminess on it. To me, it almost smells like a kind of like, uh, I just did laundry last night. Like there's a kind of fresh cotton. You just got something out of the the dryer. And you know, in that, that just deliciously clean, cottony smell is wafting up. I get a little bit of that here. Yeah, it is. It is pretty close to Monte Rosso Vineyard, um, but it's a. It's it's actually. I I should leave this open for a little while because um, I suspect it's going to open up. It's a little bit tight and closed off right now. So. Um, they, they block malolactic fermentation in the Sabella, I believe. So they don't let it go through the, the malolactic uh, conversion process where the wine's lactic acid, excuse me, malic acid, which um, is that kind of tart green apple acid, converts into 
creamy lactic acid. So this still has its, its tart green apple acid. And um, it definitely has that green apple-y thing. Uh, it's very floral to me. I mean, Chardonnay to me, like, it's often more about texture than it is about uh, flavor. I, I mean, it can be a kind of very neutral grape on its own, but it's just capable of, of having these kind of coexisting richness and and acidity, leanness, and I love that that tension in a wine. I find it so delicious. Um, the thing that this wine actually always has to me, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to um, share it tonight, is because it tastes kind of salty to me. Like I get this this saltiness from it. Does anyone else have a salty note in their Chardonnay? <laughs> I hope someone does. Yeah. Okay. Someone's got a Chablis. Yeah. So that'll probably be pretty similar. So um, the the second cheese we're gonna we're gonna eat. Yeah, salinity. Exactly. I love it. Um, is uh, well, I told you all to get the Bellwether San Andreas. Was anyone able to find that? Because I was actually not before I went on vacation last week. And when I came back, I, I on Sunday I couldn't find it anywhere. So. I got an Italian Pecorino, and then I also got a different cheese from Bellwether Farms, which is another dairy in Petaluma. Petaluma's got great cheese. If anyone lives there, I'm jealous. Um, so uh, anyway, so I've got two cheeses, but I I didn't follow my own instructions, so um, I'm sorry about that. But uh, yeah, so Pecorino, um, yeah, I know. It's a really good cheese if you can find it. Um, the cheese you'll see from Bellwether Farms, I think much more widely available around the Bay Area, which is what I got, it's called Carmody, and it's a cow's milk cheese. Um, you can substitute whatever you want, George, uh, and Parmesan is, is absolutely delicious. Yeah. Oh, someone's got Pecorino Romano from Italy. That's perfect. That's what I've got too. So, um, Pecorino it's actually just a kind of blanket term that refers to all sheep's milk cheeses from Italy. So um, Pecorino Romano is Pecorino from Rome. <laughs> um, another thing you'll see a lot here is Pecorino Sardo uh, and you'll see Pecorino Toscato. And okay, yeah, so someone else knows um, the Bellwether San Andreas. So you have these, these, these sheep's milk cheeses from various parts of Italy, and they often all are a little bit different. So the one we see the most here in the United States is Pecorino Romano. It's often used as a, a, a substitute for Parmesan. So Parmesan is made from cow's milk, Pecorino is made from sheep's milk. That's like the big difference. Um, but uh, Pecorino Romano tends to be this kind of um, harder, a little bit more crumbly cheese than, for instance, Pecorino Toscano. That's often slightly softer and milder. Um, so taste whatever you've got, taste it. This is my Italian Pecorino Romano. Mm. Okay, so... Mine is just super salty, like salt bomb. Cypress Grove, yeah, I love the Cypress Grove cheeses. Oh, Manchego's a good a good choice too. Actually, it's not it's kind of in the same family as this. Um, so my Pecorino Romano is very salty, super salty, and um, it's a little. It has that kind of slightly dry crumbliness too. Um, and there's almost kind of like a chalkiness. I find, I'm finding in the texture. It's a little bit kind of grassy, vegetal. Um, I'm now worried that the salt, I might have, I might have gone like salt on salt too much. I'm gonna see. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of wine. Okay, I think this is way too salty. I'm left with like this overwhelming saltiness in my mouth. And the wine, yeah, you got a very salty one. Um, and uh, I could imagine, I could actually imagine this going well with a, a, a different Chardonnay maybe. Um, a Chardonnay that could potentially like somehow balance out the saltiness a little bit, but 
I feel like this is just salt on salt on salt. Dang. Okay. Well, I, I, that one wasn't a home run. I didn't try these exact pairings before you all got here. So we'll find out. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to now try the Carmody, which is the, um, the sheep's milk, uh, excuse me, the cow's milk cheese from Bellwether Farms in Petaluma. Um, the thing I was hoping, yeah, I'll show you. It's a lot milder. I mean, this is not similar at all to a pecorino. It's just the same producer. Salt and Chardonnay works. Okay, interesting. So um, this is a lot milder. Wow. This, this is actually kind of a relief to the palate after all the salt. So I think this goes nicely together. Um, this kind of harder, this is what the uh, cheese looks like. This kind of harder, um, slightly nutty cheese. Then I think if you find a cheese with really nutty notes, Comte, again, one of my favorites has that. Um, I think that tends to be a really great, uh, great pairing with a lot of Chardonnays. A lot of Chardonnays a lot of Chardonnays have the similar kind of like you hear people talk about hazelnut and almond in their Chardonnays. But um, even if they don't, I think they tend to go, even if they don't have those flavors, I think they tend to go well with those flavors. Pecorino Toscano. So pe I, Pecorino Toscano I, is is not, I, I think, usually is not quite as salty as Pecorino Romano. That I would imagine that would, um, would go a little better. Yeah, and also probably the slightly softer texture of it all. Interesting. Cool. Did anyone try their pecorino with the Riesling and have thoughts on that? I'm going to try that now. It's a little better. Yeah, did anyone else do that? I don't know. I'm actually thinking this Pecorino, maybe it's just the one I got. It's not a great wine. It's not a great cheese for wine. I mean, I can imagine if I grated it on some pasta and it, I wasn't getting just a huge bite of it, but I think it's pretty salty. Like it's like having a dish that was over salted. Anyway, the Riesling is a little better, but I just think it's kind of a tough, tough one there. I love cheese. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe the pecorino will go well with the Zen. We'll see. So um, final, final wine, Zen. Oh, someone had a, a slightly sparkly Riesling. Was it um, a sparkling Riesling or just happened to kind of taste a little carbon dioxide-y. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we've discovered Riesling and Pecorino is better. Okay, Zinn, who, again, I've chosen three wines that can sometimes be kind of polarizing. A lot of people strongly dislike Riesling and Chardonnay and Zinfandel. Um, is anyone in that camp? I hope not, because I love all three of these types of wines. Oh, feta, and yeah, also a pretty salty salty cheese. Yum. So, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, um, an advocate for Riesling. I'm also totally an advocate for Zinfandel. I think it's a grape that, um, doesn't get enough love, especially here in California. A lot of people think that all Zin is, uh, jammy and brambly and sweet and, um, disgusting and it's not. There's a lot of really, really amazing Zinfandel made in California. Um, pretty much, you know, most Zinfandel in the world is made in California. It's kind of the uniquely American grape variety, even though it's it's originally um, Croatian. 
by origin, um, but it's not it's not very widely grown anywhere in the world except for California. Um, and I also think Zinfandel, one, one other reason I love so much California Zinfandel is um, it tends to be a real interesting window into our past. There are so many amazing old Zinfandel vineyards that were planted in the 19th century or the early 20th century. And the way they were planted, the stories about the people who planted them tell us so much about California's history tell us about immigration patterns and culture and how people ate and how people drank. And um, it's really amazing that anything survived prohibition in this country when you think about it. Um, and some people were making Sacramento wine. Some people were selling grapes um, to home winemakers. Some people were shipping stuff off to Canada. But um, I just think, you know, these kinds of old vineyards offer a window into the past. Um, so, okay, so I wanted to I wanted to bring in a, a kind of fuller bodied red wine. I thought about Syrah, then I remembered we had tasted a Syrah in one of our previous sessions. Um, and I thought this would be a good, good chance to get on my Zinfandel pulpit anyway. Um, so the wine I have is the HRW from Hendry Ranch Winery. That's exactly what the HRW stands for, Hendry Ranch Winery. So this is in Napa. Um, Speaking of Mount Feeder, which we were before, it's kind of just at the bottom of that. I think it's actually technically in the Oak Knoll district, but it's um, well west of Highway 29. So um, it's not, it, you, you won't have really passed it. It's actually kind of this funny little tucked away ranch in a residential neighborhood um, in Napa. And uh, you wouldn't know there's like this huge sprawling vineyard when you pass by the gate. This is one of my, uh, it's it's one of my top 25 wineries to visit right now. Um, it's a really beautiful kind of unexpected cool place to visit. They grow a great, great variety of uh, grapes on their vineyard. They, they only make wine, they're an estate winery, what we call, so they only make wine from grapes on their own vineyard and um, it's just this family that's been doing it for um, a couple of generations, doing it there. Um, so yeah, so anyway, I, I highly recommend going there for a wine tasting. You have to make a reservation as you have to do for almost everywhere right now, but um, I think it's definitely worth it. And this is like under $25 for an estate wine from Napa. It's kind of a crazy deal. Yeah. Yes. And Zin is very different in every Appalachian in California. It is a a grape that expresses a sense of place, much like cheese. <laughs> um, okay, so the I what I wanted to do here was kind of match intensity to intensity again, like I was saying. So I wanted a, a slightly kind of bolder, fruitier, bigger wine to match blue cheese, which is like the most pungent, big, robust type of cheese there is, right? Um, the classic pairing for blue cheese, specifically Stilton um, blue cheese is port, of course, which is like the most intense wine you could imagine. It's super ripe and it's fortified with brandy. So it's very boozy. So it's just this um, boozy, big, fruity wine um, that uh, is, it, you know, that's kind of the class when you think of of these kind of classic wine pairings, Stilton and Port is one of them. So I wasn't going to open any Port tonight, but uh, I think a big red wine is probably a good, Is I think it's going to hold up well. So who, tell me what Zins you guys got. A few of you have told me. Do you guys have big Zins, jammy Zins? Are they light Zins? Someone had a dash Zin. Oh, Carl... Someone's having a Carlisle Zinn from the Bedrock Vineyard, which is a, that's great. I love, love, love the Carlisle Zins. Those are also some of the best in California. And it's from, that Zinn would be from the vineyard owned by Bedrock Wine Company, which was the Riesling I tasted. Okay, so... This is a delicious Zim. Like I said, this is like, I think a really crazy value. They make, Hendry makes slightly more expensive Zins also. Um, so to me, this is like, it's not, you know, sometimes when you get a Zin, like the, the flavors don't taste like fresh 
fruit, like the type of fruit you would buy into. <laughs> they taste like dried fruit. You know, you can get those kind of the dried figs, the prunes, the dates. This zin still tastes like biting into a fresh plum, a fresh fig. Um, it's got kind of a cedary, cedary note to it too. Not like oaky from a barrel, but there's kind of like a woodsy quality to it. Okay, someone's got the a black stallion Howell Mountains in. Oh, and it's got a little bit of age on it. Ridge Three Valleys is a classic. That's a great, great, great value. Yum. The Stilton Blue Cheese one over the Zen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, again, kind of a, a, a generous wine. It's not a small wine, but it's balanced. Okay, I'm gonna taste some blue cheese if you haven't already. So, mm. okay, if you're gonna eat Bay Area blue cheese, it has to be Point Reyes, original blue, right? Well, they have another blue cheese called Bay Blue also. But, um, so Point Reyes, you all know where that is. They've been making this for at least a couple of decades. Um, oh, someone has the actual HRW. That's great. Um, so uh, this is a cow's milk blue cheese. So blue cheese is also kind of a polarizing cheese. Does anyone here like strongly dislike, like they'll never eat blue cheese? Some people don't like it. So, you know, blue cheese, the way they get it blue is um, they actually inject or in some way introduce um, penicillium, the mold, let it develop. Then it becomes this uh, totally ugly looking <laughs> creation with blue or greenish uh, dots all over it. But um, I find it so delicious. And so, you know, there's a blue cheeses can really range, right? Like you can get some really kind of super ripe tasting, pungent um, blue cheeses. This, I mean, this tastes like a blue cheese. Um, but this has a kind of creamier, milder uh, bent to it. Yeah, Roquefort, that's a great, great blue cheese also. Um, so let's see how this goes. This is pretty salty also, actually, as far as cheeses go. This tastes good. This is like almost too salty for the wine. I mean, this actually is a, a this is in maybe um, it's a little bit light for the for the uh, cheese. So some you know some people say about the Point Reyes Blue is that you can um, you can taste the ocean salty air because the the cheese is made and the cows um, graze very close to the ocean. Maybe we're getting some of that West Marin Pacific. Pacific breeze. Yeah, okay, we gotta try the blue with the Riesling, right? Never met a cheese you haven't loved. I pretty much feel that way too. Okay. This is the winner. I think this tastes great. The Riesling with the blue. Hmm. Maybe it's because there is kind of a suggestion of sweetness in the Riesling and the funkiness of the petrol with the funkiness of the blue cheese. I think that goes great. I think that goes really, really well. So we're learning that Riesling maybe is like the most versatile food pairing wine, right? And that it can uh, really hold up well to super salty foods. Um, oh, Gorgonzola, that's good. Yeah. Um, you don't have to worry about being a blue cheese wimp. <laughs> We're all wimps about something. Um, cool. Well, uh, I, I feel like... Um, these aren't 
the three best cheese and wine pairings I've ever had, but we're discovering some interesting similarities. Yeah, Roquefort could maybe be too strong for the Zen. Um, oh, we've got someone else who has the HRW. That's great. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, maybe there is something to this, you, you know, I mean, you can't get a more pungent wine than port, I think. Like, it's just firing on all cylinders. So um, maybe for, you know, a blue cheese like that, that's just what you need. But so here's what I kind of think. If we were just like sitting around having a conversation, if I could see you guys and we weren't like totally, because no one actually eats and drinks the way I've been doing here, right? You don't like take a sip, eat a bite, take another sip. Um, I just feel like it wouldn't, you don't think about it as much. Like it wouldn't bother you as much if it were just like slightly off. Okay, I'm going to try my Pecorino with the Zen. Hold on. That's why I kind of think um, some of these things are all a little overblown. Okay, Zen and Pecorino. Let's see. My Zen is smelling so good. It's just like a, a bowl of ripe cherries. Mm. Mm. Someone's going to another tasting now. Good for you. Mm. Um, I like that. I still think my pecorino is like way too salty. I think I'm just going to grate it on some pasta later in the week. I don't think it's a cheese for eating. Did anyone else have a, um, at this point it's all good. I know. I haven't been spitting. It's it's starting to taste pretty good. Um, this is this is pretty much um we've run through the wines. Does anyone have any questions, comments, things you want to bring up while we have a few minutes left? Gruyere, Gruyere is a great. I love Gruyere. That can also have some of those really deliciously nutty nutty notes to it. Um, that I think is so delicious. Does anyone drink sherry? I think sherry, sherry is a, sherry is a, it's another fortified wine. It also often has those super nutty notes to it. And, um, I'm actually wondering if that would go really well with, uh, the pecorino perhaps as I'm saying this and those kind of slightly funky oxidized flavors in some sherries. Anyway, um, any other questions? Any thoughts? The best pairing for shard. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, after tasting that, I'm almost thinking I would want to go on a more delicate, delicate side of fresh goat cheese, um, uh, an exploration of port. <laughs> then we'd really be, we'd have to spit for that. We'd really be in trouble. Port's like 20, 20 plus percent alcohol. Um, Parmesan could def Parmesan goes well probably with just about anything. A lot of cheese experts consider Parmesan to be the greatest cheese in the world. Um, I I it's funny, yeah. Like for a Chardonnay, I could imagine even like a you know if you wanted to just totally indulge your senses, like get a big old blob of burrata and the creamy creaminess of it and the creaminess of the Chardonnay. Strong cheese always goes with strong wines. You disagree. Interesting. Um, what do you what do you think, DW? Would you do a, a more delicate cheese with a stronger wine or or the inverse? We'll see. Um, yeah, sherry has gone out of favor, but it's um, poised for a comeback. There's sherry's. A, I mean, sherry's interesting. So you know, sherry's from. Um, from Southern Spain, from the Jerez region. And um, it actually encompasses a pretty wide, wide range of wine styles. They're all fortified, but um, you can have, you can have, there's a, there's a certain style of sherry called Pedro Jimenez that's, that basically tastes like port. 
it's very syrupy, like you would pour it on your pancakes. It's so syrupy. And then there's other, much more kind of like a aperitif style, lighter, uh, brighter styles of sherry. Yeah. Yeah. Dow, Dow's late bottle vintage is a good, that's a good one. Um, it's a good kind of dependable one. The six grapes is also a good one. Chardonnay and pate. That would be really good. I know I could use a little bit of, um, something more, more substantial after this. Um, oh yeah. Pairing by varietal. That's a great idea. Um, I could certainly imagine cheese and fruit going with a delicate white wine. Yeah, that maybe the the fruit could even kind of balance out some of the um, the aspects of a cheese that might might be clashing with the wine. Um, another tasting with a week to find the wines. Well, we'll give you a lot a lot more advance notice next time. I'm, it's such a challenge. I I imagine many of you are in the Bay Area, but um, we're hoping to get, you know, I'm, I'm always just trying to figure out a way to get it so that it's easy for you guys to get the wines and we can all, I don't know. I mean, it's fun to have different wines, but um, I, some of you have, have said you'd like to all have the same wines. And I know that's a little bit tricky. We're not in the wine fulfillment business here at the Chronicle, which makes it a little bit difficult to distribute. Um, but yeah, well, um, I think, Unless anyone else has any other comments, I think we've we've tasted through the wines, we've tasted through the cheeses. I hope you've discovered some things that you enjoyed, um, maybe some things you didn't enjoy as I did. I still have a salty taste in my mouth. I don't know if, <laughs> if anyone else does, um, but I'm like, I feel like I need to get rid of all the saltiness. Um, but. Uh, but anyway, for those of you who live in the Bay Area, obviously we're we're spoiled. It's an embarrassment of riches here um, in terms of the cheeses that are made here, the wines that are made here. We're very lucky. We we get to experience world class versions of both, um, and so we'll figure out ways to. We'll, you know, we're going to continue um, tinkering with this, and at some point we'll even gather in person and taste wines together as we did before the pandemic began and confined us all to our homes. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that too. And then it'll be a lot easier to make sure we all have the same things in front of us. Um, so anyway, so so thank you so much for joining us on this, this summery Tuesday afternoon. Um, I think we're all hopefully a little bit glad to be here in the Bay Area, not up in the Pacific Northwest where they're experiencing such intense heat. Um, but uh, I just want to thank you all for joining. Um, I really, really especially want to thank all of you who are Chronicle subscribers. Um, the work I do and all of my colleagues do would just not be possible without you. And um, it truly means a lot to me and to, to all of my amazing colleagues um, to have your support. So uh, with that in mind, I hope you all go on and eat something delicious for dinner tonight. And cheers. <laughs>